Well, good morning and welcome in Jesus' name to our service this morning. Um, however you're joining us, whether you're uh, listening on the phone, whether you're watching on Facebook or on our website, it is wonderful to have you with us as we, as we gather together virtually uh, in Jesus' name for this service of worship. Um, uh, one or two things uh, just to mention uh, by way of announcement this morning. Uh, some of you will have seen the, the notices uh, rolling on the, the screen um, just at the beginning of our service there, but uh, just a few things uh, to mention. One is that in a couple of weeks' time, on the 22nd of February, we're going to be starting a Christianity Explored course. We're going to be doing that on Zoom. And that will be a great course uh, for, uh, for you to do if perhaps you've joined with us uh, over these past uh, few months and you're interested in finding out more uh, about the Christian faith, what it means to be a, a Christian, uh, then Christianity Ex Explored will be a great course for you to come along to uh, to find out more. It'll be a great course for you to come to if perhaps you're somebody who is thinking uh, about uh, church membership, um, or perhaps uh, you're already a Christian and either you want a refresher or uh, perhaps you've got uh, children or neighbors or friends that you could invite along uh, to join us for this exploration of the Christian faith. It's a seven-week course um, and we'll be running uh, from Monday the 22nd, half past seven uh, in the evening. On, uh, it's on Zoom. Um, so, you know, you can, you can mute everyone and mute yourself or, you know, it's a, it's a really um, an easy environment in which to, to come and to, to find out more. Um, so that is, is Christianity Explored. Um, do consider it um, if, if you've never been before and uh, do think uh, about who you might be able to invite um, uh, along to that. Uh, so that's Christianity Explored, and um, to register for that, uh, we are looking for people to register. You can go to uh, the live stream page of our website, and I think there's also a link on the home page of our website as well, sterlingnorth.org, and you'll be able to register for that. Uh, Christianity Explored. Uh, another new thing we're going to start on Zoom is a, a Zoom prayer meeting on uh, Wednesday uh, evenings. Um, that's going to start on uh, Wednesday, the 24th of February, and there'll be more details about that nearer the time, um, but do just keep that uh, in your minds just now. Prayer uh, really is the engine room of a, of a church, and uh, that'll be a great opportunity for us to get together and to pray. Uh, tea at three. Um, last week, there was a problem with the link. Um, so that I know there were a number of you who weren't able to join T3. Um, I do apologize uh, for that. Um, we'll be sending out the link for this afternoon's T3 uh, just uh, after 12 o'clock, and um, we'll hopefully avoid uh, any such problems in the future. Uh, and this afternoon we've got a quiz. Jackie is going to uh, Jackie White is going to lead us uh, in a quiz this afternoon. So T3 will be a bit different today, and we do hope that you can join us for that. Uh, the, the final thing to say is that I know um, a number of you have been, um, have been in touch to, to find out details of uh, the funeral of Kathleen Jarvis. Um, it's finally been arranged uh, this week um, and the funeral will be on Tuesday the 16th of February at 10 a.m. Uh, here at the church and 11 a.m. at St. Thomas's Crematorium. Obviously, under the current uh, COVID restrictions, uh, numbers are limited, um, but we do have spaces for uh, people from the church uh, to come along um, and pay their respects and, and to support uh, Rodney and Nigel, um, her sons. Um, and if you would like to attend the funeral, then please uh, get in touch with us, either give us a call or email the office uh, and let us know. And if uh, as long as we can keep the numbers below 20 uh, and within the, the allowable limits, then um, we'll have space for people. So please get in touch uh, about that. Let me read just a few words from Psalm 47. 
God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. We're going to sing together our opening song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. I should, uh, should have mentioned before a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us today from Sochi and Coles Naughton. It's, uh, it's good to have uh, you with us uh, this morning. Um, and uh, one other thing to mention that uh, slipped my mind there, which was on Wednesday evening, we've got a Kirk session uh, meeting, uh, so all elders should have the, the link for that, and um, board members as, as well, uh, you're invited to the opening part of that meeting. Um, and everyone should have the details for that. If you've not got the details, um, then do get in touch with me. Um, and that's Wednesday evening uh, at half past seven. Let's come before God now in prayer. And as we pray, we'll say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Almighty God, you are the one who was and is 
and is to come. And we come before you today as your people to offer you our thanks and praise. We come rejoicing that in all the uncertainties of life we find in you the one who is unchanging, a rock on which we can build our lives, a shield to protect us along the way, a light to guide our footsteps, and a love that fills our hearts with joy. Forgive us, Lord God, that we are slow sometimes to remember your goodness and swift to forget your many blessings. We lose sight of the resources you put at our disposal, dwelling on our fears rather than your strength, our problems rather than your promises, our lives rather than your kingdom. We become wrapped up in what is unimportant, putting our trust in what finally cannot satisfy and our energy into what is ultimately secondary to our calling. Lord, you have always been true to us, rich in mercy and abounding in grace. May we know your mercy and grace in our lives as we receive the forgiveness you freely offer. Almighty God, would you this day give us strength when we are overstrained, guidance when we are perplexed, courage when we are afraid. Deliver us from undue self-concern that we may, may find the fulfillment uh, in the service of others. Make us sensitive to others' needs and swift to meet them. Save us from fret and tension and anxiety that having done the best we can, we leave the rest at your disposal. And in all things, joy or sorrow, success or failure, health or sickness, mold us, we pray, nearer to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we uh, spent our, our Sunday morning looking at a passage from 1 Samuel chapters uh, 7 and 8, and we, we focused on uh, some words from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7 and verse 12, uh, reflecting on the words, thus far the Lord has helped us. Today, following our, our 50th anniversary service last week, I, I thought it would be helpful for us uh, to return uh, to that passage uh, as we look at what it has to say to us about moving into the future. So we're going to read now First, chap uh, first Samuel chapter 7 um, from verse 15 through Samuel chapter 8, verse 9. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served in Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, 
Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And thank you to Ilsa for reading for us this morning. You know, sometimes in life, something happens and it and it just changes everything. A phone call comes in the middle of the night and your, your world is turned upside down. The results of a, a hospital test come back and life will never be the same again. A lost job, a mounting debt, a broken relationship, a failed exam, a missed opportunity. These are all things that, that bring about change and uncertainty in our lives. It's not easy and it's often heart-wrenching. For all of us, uh, this past year has seen our way of life, our way of, of being church, our way of, of doing simple things like shopping and queuing, uh, have all changed. And how do we handle these changes when they, they come our way? And, you know, as we think um, particularly about the future, um, what do we do when the pandemic is over, and, and how do we prepare for it? You know, um, Abraham Lincoln uh, once wrote in a, a message to Congress, the, dog the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act new. Change, such as the, the changes that we're, we're all experiencing, forces us to think anew and to act anew. We need to do that as individuals, and I believe we need to do that as well as a church. I think it would be terribly sad if after the pandemic is over, which may well be some time from now, but it would be sad if things simply went back to the way they were before. We need to think anew and act anew as we seek to, to serve our parish and to reach the lost with the good news of the gospel. That's what we were thinking about at our anniversary service last week, wasn't it? How we meet may have changed, but our mission of making disciples has not. This is hard and it's daunting. But let's look at what the Bible says in this passage about these things. The first thing for us to note is that Samuel was living through a time of, of great change. If you look at the, the closing verses of, of chapter 7, you see that, that Samuel's got this well-established pattern of, of ministry. He goes in this same circuit year after year after year from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah. He always returns home to Ramah. He's got this pattern. It's a settled rhythm of, of life and ministry that he follows. And that perhaps, barring a, a few ups and downs, is how we might think of the, the past 50 years. A settled pattern of ministry. But then as, as chapter 8 begins, everything changes. The people, the, the elders of Israel, uh, they see a need for change. Samuel's sons aren't working out. They're not following in their father's footsteps. And, and that's, the, that's the presenting issue, if you like. But there's, there's more going on in the world at this time than that. This was a, a time of, of great change in the, in the world. It was the, the dawn of the Iron Age. There were new tools for farming, new weapons for war, warfare, new opportunities for trade. And Israel needed to be in a position to take advantage of all of these things or, or risk being left behind and, and overrun by its enemies. At the time Samuel was, was judging Israel, Israel was 
It was basically a, a kind of loose confederation of tribes. Each tribe had its, its own leader. In order to adapt to a changing world, they needed to be more united. And appointing a king to lead them was the most obvious way of doing that. And so through all of these external pressures, the need for change comes. And it comes to to a reluctant Samuel. A completely different way of ordering the life of God's people is required because of forces beyond his control. Not so different, perhaps, from where we are just now. But how do you feel about change? I like routine and and rhythm in life, and I find that I don't cope all that well with change. It can sometimes take me quite a long time to come to terms with a new way of doing things. If I think back to to March and and April last year and our our first goes at, at live streaming, I found them particularly stressful. Um, And I suspect there's one or two. I'm looking over at Sheena here to see if she found it stressful. She's nodding. We still find it stressful. It was such a change, and it remains, this remains, doesn't it, such a a new and and different way of, of doing things. I think for most of us, accepting that there needs to be change is, is something that is rarely sudden or instant. And that's what you can see here if you, you look at Samuel. He, he, he's, he, he's not someone who readily accepts the change that is proposed. Initially, he's, he's hurt by the request. And you can imagine the, the thoughts and the questions that have been going through his, his mind. He's had this settled pattern of ministry for years. And then all of a sudden, the elders come and say, we don't want that anymore. We want something new. And, and Samuel's thinking, you know, have I failed? Have I been doing it wrong all this time? I wonder if that resonates with you. Someone makes a suggestion of, of changing something, a new way of, of doing things. You've always done something one particular way, and, and it's worked well, it's served you well, and then someone comes along and says, here's this new way of doing things. You should try doing it this way. How many of us would hear that as the person saying, the way you've been doing it all this time has been wrong? I think that's what's going on here. Samuel has given his life to serving the the people of God, yet when when they ask for change, one which would undoubtedly be better for Israel uh, at the time uh, they found themselves in, he he finds himself feeling as if he's been rejected, as if somehow he has failed the people, as if somehow he's failed God. But that is not the case. And so when Samuel uh, prays to God, God is quick to console him, empathizing with him and, and encouraging with him. Samuel's new role would be, God knew, would be more difficult, more demanding. And he needed, Samuel needed to know that God was on his side. He also needed to know that all that had gone before was not bad or, or wrong. It's just that a new pattern was required in a new world. In the same way, as we experience and endure change, we must encourage one another and look fondly on the past without yearning for it. Just because a change is required, it doesn't mean that everything that has gone before was a failure. The second thing uh, just to, to take from this story is that when we make changes and when changes happen, things may not always go according to to plan. They they may not always work out. You know, it's a valuable lesson for us that Samuel's first go at appointing a king fails. He, he, if you you read on in the the book of, of Samuel, he appoints Saul, and Saul is a bit of a disaster as king. He doesn't work out, and Samuel ends up having to uh, anoint and appoint David 
as king, as as Saul's successor. And it's only with David that the royal house is established, and it's only with David's son, Solomon, that a mature government emerges. And these days of of David and and Solomon are, are the high points of Israel's history. But if Samuel had given up after Saul, after it had gone wrong once, then he never would have succeeded. I was thinking about uh, that this week and how different our world is today. And you only need to look at the the world of of football management to see that that's the case. Uh, I think earlier this week, Bournemouth's manager, um, who was a a relatively young guy um, who had been with the club as a player and a coach for 20-odd years, and uh, he's now been in the job six months. They're sixth in the league, and he lost his job Uh, Frank Lampard was Chelsea manager for 18 months, um, and he got sacked just a couple of weeks ago. And the Chelsea owner said that um, Frank Lampard left the team in mid-table without any path to sustained improvement. But just two months ago, they were top of the league. We want instant success, and we are no longer prepared to wait for it. If you forgive another Uh, football example then when Sir Alex Ferguson went to to Manchester United um, he endured uh, several seasons um, of of relative failure and disappointment he didn't enjoy success right away but if he had been sacked in those early years of his tenure then surely the club would have missed out on all the success that he went on to bring we want instant success, but it doesn't always happen that way. And so, as as we as a church try new things, we we do so knowing that they won't always work out first time. That doesn't mean we should give up, and it doesn't mean that God isn't uh, behind whatever it is that we are doing. Rather, we have a God who works in and, and through our failures in ways that we cannot conceive or imagine. So we need to be patient. We need to encourage one another, and we need to be patient in the face of failure. And of course, if we if we aren't people who are encouraging to one another, then we'll find it very difficult to be patient when things don't go well. But the final lesson from Samuel is perhaps the most important one. When God was comforting Samuel, he told him. It's not you they have rejected, but me as king over them. You read this, and it seems to suggest that the people of Israel were wrong in even asking for a king. But if we were to turn to the book of of Deuteronomy, we we would see that, you know, Israel having a king has, has always been part of God's plan. So what then was the problem with the request? Well, the problem lay in their motivation which is clear in the way they phrase their demand. Appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. You see, the problem with the request wasn't asking for a king. It was in this, those last few words. We want to be like the other nations. And in doing that, the people were rejecting God. God's purpose for Israel was that they would be distinctive and holy, that they would ultimately be a blessing to the other nations. It certainly wasn't God's desire for them to be like the other nations. And so Deuteronomy anticipates uh, that Israel has a, would have a king, but, but the, the, it, it places certain limits on what that king would be like. He would be quite unlike the king's of the other nations. It says that he wouldn't acquire for himself horses or gold or silver or many wives, and he would not exalt himself above his fellow Israelites. He would be quite unlike the kings of the surrounding nations and quite unlike the king that the elders are asking Samuel to appoint. And so Samuel is faced with how to deal with this situation. God instructs him to 
to warn the people, and, and there's a speech that Samuel gives immediately following uh, our reading where he, he, he gives this great warning, but eventually uh, the decision is taken, and God instructs Samuel to go and to appoint a king. And so Samuel needs to work out how to do this in a way that is different from the other nations. And eventually, in chapters 11 and 12, he takes the the people of Israel to the place where they first entered the promised land. And he reminds them of all that God has done for them. And it's there that Saul is anointed as king over the people. And as Saul is crowned, the people and the king renew their covenant with God. You see, Samuel and Israel are doing something new. But as they bring about this new way of of doing things, they root what they are doing firmly in the promises and in the grace and in the character of God. I think the temptation for the church and, and the world today for Christians today. The temptation for us is to become like the world in order to become attractive to the world. And that temptation is just as real for us today as it was in Samuel's time. Like the Israelites, we long to become like the world around us in order to make the gospel attractive to others. However, the same demand Samuel placed upon Israel to renew their allegiance to God's kingly rule is echoed by Jesus in Matthew 6 when he says he wants his followers to seek first the kingdom of God. The story of Samuel teaches us therefore that in the midst of great cultural and social change we must seek God's kingdom above anything else. We are to be rooted in the promises, in the covenant, and in the grace of God. So, encourage one another. Be patient with one another when things don't work out when, uh, as we might hope. And remain rooted in the promises and grace of God. This is how we change and move forward into the future. And we can also hold on to the fact that although uh, that, that through that kingship that was established in Samuel's time, the world would eventually get the king that was promised in Deuteronomy. Through the, 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 the monarchy, if you like, that Samuel established, the world would eventually receive this king who was like any other king. A king who comes to us in in great humility. A king who was born in a stable and not in a royal palace. A king who lived a a life not of riches and, and luxury, but of poverty and concern for the poor. A king who would humble himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And there at the cross, he would make a new covenant with us. Just as Samuel reminded the the Israelites of God's faithfulness to them, so the cross reminds us of God's faithfulness to us. It assures us that God is, is for us and that He is with us and that He has defeated darkness and death for us. And as we look to the cross, we are reminded that He reigns over us and the world, even if it doesn't always seem like it. The challenges uh, we face as we move into the future may well lead us to believe that we do indeed face a stormy present piled high with difficulty. And whilst we may need to think anew and act anew, we do so knowing not only that God has burst into the world to make all things new, but also He is coming again. And so our prayer is not unlike that of the elders of Israel. Appoint for us a King, Lord God. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we uh, 
as we reflect on uh, God's Word to us this morning and of the King that He has appointed. We'll sing once more uh, the words of that great hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Point for us a king. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Lord our God, you have surrounded us with the good gifts of your love. And we remember them now and we thank you, the giver. You have given us the gift of life itself. For the years of, uh, that are past, we thank you. For the years that are to come, we trust you. And for all the joys and opportunities of this present time, we bless you. You have given us the gift of love. And so for our friends, our families, and for all the human relationships that enrich our lives, we praise you. You have given us the, the gift of, of power to, to use the physical world around us. The good fruits of science and technology are, are gifts of, your, of yours for our enjoyment. You've given us Christ, and through him you have offered us life indeed, and love and power for this world and for the world to come. For this, your greatest gift, we thank you from the very fullness of our hearts. Father, hear us as we pray for our world in this time of extraordinary need. 
Help all of us as we work together against this virus. We pray that measures put in place by our government would be sufficient to reduce transmission and that we might see restrictions being eased in the not too distant future. We pray for the rollout of the vaccine, that people would receive it as quickly, easily, and fairly as possible. Help governments, civil servants, advisors, the military, and manufacturers all over the world work to end, work to this end, and to bring a, a global solution for a global problem. We thank you for the work of our scientists and pray for them as they research, monitor, and develop vaccines as the virus continues to change. We do pray for effective and long-lasting immunity for all people. We pray for those who are working on the front line, for doctors and nurses and other healthcare staff. We pray for those who are sick and those who are gravely ill. We pray for parents and teachers and children. We pray for those who fear redundancy, for those who have lost confidence in themselves, for all who are worn down in body or in mind by the burdens which they carry. Lord God, would you bless and strengthen the bonds of family life within our land. Teach us how to understand one another better, parents and children, husbands and wives. And through this deeper understanding, deepen our love. May peace and joy dwell in our hearts and in our homes. Father, we bring you now the special needs of people known to us as neighbors and as friends. Those who are sick, those who are bereaved, those who are lonely, those who are afraid, those who are ashamed, and those who are bitter. You know their needs better than we do. Give them not what we ask, but what your love directs. Eternal God, we trust you not for this world alone, but for the world to come. We remember our own loved ones who have passed through death to a new life. For their memory we give thanks, and for our fellowship with them now in your presence. Bring us at the last where they are, to those things which our lips cannot utter, but which our hearts long for, in the glory of your kingdom. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is one that speaks of, of stepping out in faith, of being uh, prepared for and ready for change. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail, there we find God, and on him our faith shall stand. We sing together oceans where feet may fail. Sovereign hand, we will 
May God take us deeper than our feet could ever wander, where our faith would be made stronger in the presence of our Savior. May now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forevermore. Amen.